this is going to be an important study. We're in the middle of something that most people don't know a thing about. Is that true, people in the room? Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. Would you say that even people who study the Bible for years don't have a clue about what we're studying this afternoon? Yeah, that's for sure. All right, so uh, before we get started, uh, we uh, will pray briefly, asking for the Holy Spirit, and uh, that's something you can do with us. Heavenly Father, we address you with uh, a sense of awe and wonder that you are our Father. Give us uh, a measure of your Spirit that we can respond to you and accurately teach others. And we ask these blessings in Jesus' name, who has promised that we would receive them. Amen. Amen. Uh, we should be praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is sometimes called the, uh, the latter rain. Right? That's what these studies are here to help us do. Okay, so let's look at the slide. Let us plunge right in and continue to learn about Sha'ol, the realm of the dead, and learn much more about the state of the dead who are there. Psalm 88 tells us about a man who is sick and dying and already accounted as dead. Uh, in our culture, we would naturally think of a terminal cancer patient. Oh, this guy's in stage four. He's already saying he's weak and already counted as a dead man, right? Mm -hmm. Indeed, the psalmist says that he's been sickly all his life. For my soul, and here's right away where we have a stumbling block. My soul is full of evil or misery, and my life draws near to Sheol. Sheol is the realm of the dead. It's not a grave. It's the collective realm of the dead all together. That's the way the prophets picture it. Now, my issue is with the word soul here. That gives you the idea that there's some kind of soul that is separate from the body, but a nephesh is a what? Genesis 2, 7. Being. It's the, a, a, a live creature, a, a body that has life in it. Okay? All right. What, just to see if you know this, what in the body... Where is the life in the body? It's, it's in the blood. And that's why you are never to drink another man's blood or indeed what? That of an animal. That of an animal. You're drinking the life and that's forbidden. That the blood belongs to God. And that's been forbidden all the way through the scriptures, ever since Noah, that's when that order was given, and that applies to all men. That's right, the covenant with Noah. You're right, the covenant of Noah was the covenant to the only people there were, and all, anyone who happens to be descended from Noah. <laughs> okay, here he says, my soul, no, my nephesh, my body is full of evil, is full of misery and my life draws near to Sheol. I, if, if it said my body, I'd have no issue. I'm counted among those who go down to the pit. I'm a man who has no strength, like one set loose among the dead. If there's anything we have been told about the dead that characterizes them, that distinguishes them from the living, is what? They are weak, powerless. They have no power. They are weak and hence the misery in Revelation. What does every person who suffers the second death want to be? Wants to be God, to have all the power, to be able to rule everybody else. And the reason that they are miserable is what? They can't. They, they are aware of, just about the only thing they are aware of is that what? They have no power. Like the slain that lie in the grave or tomb, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Well, he's not there, but he's speaking as if it's certain that he's going to be there. The psalmist, this psalmist doesn't merely plead to be spared death. He sets forth his arguments, as we'll see, 
and they illuminate the nature of the dead. The first uh, question he asked, and this is a um, rhetorical question, do you work wonders for the dead? Do the Rephaim, what does that mean? The fallen ones, the collapsed ones, the, the weak ones, right? Do they rise up to praise you? This is a rhetorical question. What's the answer to the two questions? No. No. Well, wait a minute. Aren't there righteous people who are dead? Yes. Well, don't, don't they praise God? Not from the grave, they don't. <laughs> Why do they not? You have to have a mouth and be able to breathe. And oh, that's because the word praise means to sing or shout out loud. Right, and you can't do that with, without a body. With, with, a, with a, none of the being completely without any physical qualities. It says in a text that we're going to read today that the dead don't praise the Lord. And that seems to indicate to people who think that the dead are just unconscious that yeah that's what they were right about that no that's because you misunderstood what the Hebrew word means obviously the point of this question is that as long as God preserves his life the psalmist can see the, can see the wonders God is performing in his behalf this is the phrase signs and wonders things performed in the real world not in the non-material realm of the dead further if he is among the dead, he, like them, will be unable to rise up another physical act and praise or confess the name of God. In each of these things, the psalmist says he will lack the ability to praise God that he possesses while he's still a living being. Yes, as usual, the psalm is translated as soul for nephesh. And that's, that just furthers the misconception, right? Uh -huh. The simple reason he cannot praise or confess God is he does not have a body. The kind of shout of praise he describes requires that one be alive. Here's the next rhetorical question. Still Psalm 88. Is your covenant love, chesed, is a very common uh, word in Hebrew. It means covenant love, that is to say faithful love or the kind of love you can count on. Is your covenant love, chesed, declared in the grave or your faithfulness in a bad... Now look, as soon as I see the word declare, I know that the answer is no. Why? Nobody can say anything, right? Note how often in a random selection we have found the term abaddon, which means destruction. In fact, we find that very word in Revelation. Not by accident paired with Sheol. What does it mean? It means destruction. We see that in Revelation, the demonic army rises from Abaddon in the fifth trumpet. And that's a really bad deal. Mm. As long as they are restrained, things are miserable. When they are unrestrained in the fifth trumpet, the, the angel of the bottomless pit, which is Satan, has the key, he's given the key, he unlocks it, they come up, and then things really get bad for the human race, right? The, do the demonic army rises from Abaddon in the fifth trumpet. And no, again, this is again, the answer to the rhetorical question is no. God's covenant love, chesed, is not declared in Sheol. Not because no one has ever heard of it, but because no one can declare anything. They have no bodies. Now, declare or sofer is what a scribe does in two parts. The first part is writing or inscribing the praise of God in a scroll. You can write it out. That's one way to declare it. The second part is reading what the scroll says aloud, thus completing the act of declaring God's covenant love. But writing requires a live body in the material world. Once the writing is done, one even more needs a material body to exclaim or proclaim God's covenant love. The psalmist's complaint is he will be unable to do any of these things in Sheol. Another one. Are your wonders known in the darkness or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? Right. This is a question, and all of these questions are complaints. He's really saying, I don't want to die now. Right. 
These complaints have been building to a crescendo, and this is the last big argument. These things are done in the material world and cannot be known in a land where there's no light, hence no sight. No light at all. You don't need light. It's like those fish with no eyes, right? That I keep telling you about down, down there in Mammoth Cave in the, in the darkened pools of water, hundreds of feet below the surface. Oh, this eye sockets, you can see the little indentation. There just aren't any eyes, right? That's adaptation. That's the way God created things. We call it evolution, except we don't use that word because it means evolving without a creator, right? Okay, so we'd have to just say adaptation. All right, there's a, a land of no sight, a land of forgetfulness. In the salvation history of Israel, God has done many mighty acts of salvation and judgment. Signs and wonders, a common phrase indeed, are known in the material world. Uh, and and we're, we're going to get to this right down at the bottom here. They're known in the material world. Are your wonders known? There's a catch in this sentence. A catch that the modern reader would miss. Here we come to a huge crux in correct exegesis where those who think the dead are in heaven or hell, or equally those who think the dead are unconscious rather than asleep. Say, did anybody ever go unconscious in the ancient world? Oh, I'm sure they did. Did they have battles? Yep. Did anybody ever get knocked in the head really hard? Oh, I'm sure. No and, doubt. And come back out of the thing later? Yeah, probably so. So, uh, do we really have to think these People never knew the difference between being unconscious and being asleep? Oh, no, they knew. Yeah. Okay. All right. No light, no sight. Uh, signs and wonders are known in the material world. What's the crux? Correct test because Jesus says they're not in heaven, not in hell, not unconscious. The key is the verb to know which can never be divorced from its physical world settling. You know only what you have experienced. Uh -huh. right? And the problem in Sheol is you get no new experience. What new experience do you get exactly? Boom, you're dead. That's as much as you're going to know. It's really different from being alive. You get some rest. Yeah, well, it's true that you don't have to worry about making a mortgage payment. Right. Rest yeah, in peace. You get some rest. The righteous can rest in peace as long as they know what they are worried about that we've, we're going to see in certain questions. Please don't leave me here. All right. You know only what you have experienced. Implications. And Hebrew thought you can know many things, but you perceive them through your senses and your experiences. Sexual intercourse is a way to know one's partner, for instance. You don't know anything in abstraction, which is a key Greek thought. Okay? Knowing in the abstract, because after all, what's good to a Greek? The real or the ideal? Now, the ideal is based on the word idea. Uh -huh. right? I, I, the ideal is. The ideal. So we can learn and know things in Greek thought that you can't know in Hebrew thought. We'll come presently to a proof text that proves the dead know nothing at all, or utterly unconscious. That's the problem with proof texts. We don't have time to exegete this passage, but here is the misquoted relevant part. For the living know, see there's the catch, know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. All right. The dead know nothing. They're unconscious. That means they don't experience anything. There's nothing to experience. Yeah. And they have no more reward for the memory of them is forgotten. We'll go back to this Ecclesiastes proof text later on. But the living know that they will die, but the dead do not know anything. There's a huge catch in how Hebrew thought sees what to know means. When we think of someone knowing something, it can be entirely cerebral. That's because we are Westerners. 
Our thinking is based on Greek thought. But knowing is always connected to actual experience in biblical thought. We always have to check our misconceptions at the door when we see a text with to know in it. Well, they haven't experienced death yet. The living know that they will die. Well, they haven't died yet. They haven't experienced that yet. So how do they know that they will die? There must be some experience involved because their pets die. Their other animals die, many of which they slaughter themselves. And because parents, children, extended family, even enemies all die. Is that an experience? That's Do you experience. experience something when your father dies? Yeah. And rot away and become nothing but a few bones, gathered a year after they died, with the body completely dissolved, and those bones are then thrown on a pile of ancestors' bones. That's what the phrase being gathered to your ancestors means. Huh. Look, they have this tomb. It's been carved out of the, the rock. Fortunately, it's a lot of sandstone in, in uh, Palestine, so it's not terribly hard, but still it's a lot of work. And there are niches for a dozen people. But you can't leave the bodies there because it's possible that 13 people will die. And if you only have 12 niches, you've got a problem. So what do they do? They leave the bodies there, and after a year, they come back, and they go to niche number seven, right? And they take sister out. She's now, she doesn't have a nephesh anymore, right? She's just got bones, okay? And what are we going to do with them? We're going to gather them up? Later on, they put them in bone boxes. But through most of the Old Testament, they just gather them up, put them in a pile. That's what being gathered to your ancestors was. It's rather creepy, huh? Well, that's how they did it. All right, so. Uh, all right, from this uh, would be a good place to take stock of what we know so far. First, Sheol is a place where the collective dead end up. The title is used everywhere from Genesis to Ezekiel from the earliest Old Testament narratives to the Babylonian exile. As the Babylonian exile, you're only, you're only 75 years from the end of the Old Testament. It's a big concept that goes a long, long time. 60 times, it says, appearing in historical narratives, in conversations, in oracles and prophetic utterances, and in psalms and other poetry, and in the wisdom literature. Right? That tells me something. This isn't some quirky thing that some poetic image that some poet decided to write down. No, no, it's, it's much too universal. Despite the relative ignorance of modern Bible readers, it is an inescapable key element for understanding the nature of death in the Bible. The title, oh, this is important. The title of Sha'ol, where does it come from? It comes from a verb. Sha'el, to ask, to inquire, to seek. Okay, take a guess. Who exactly is being inquired of and sought? It could be, and often is, a god or a deity. But given the widespread nature of the cult of the dead, then, as now, and even more so in the future, it is the supposed dead that are being inquired of for guidance. That quality of the verb derash, seek diligently, inquire of, is the whole key to Isaiah 8.20, a formative text we already consulted. Now look. And when they say to you, inquire of, seek diligently, consult the mediums and the necromancers, Necros is death, so necromancy is somebody who deals with the dead, who chirp and mutter. Should not the people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? You say it's illogical. Okay. We're seeing a verb here used to, of seeking God diligently, but the hearers are being encouraged to seek the supposed dead instead. 
Now, how dangerous was this really? Since the dead have no power, whatever, was it really all that dangerous? Yahoo, yeah. yes. Yes, very much so. <laughs> the dead in general were not the responders. Every time they do a reading, and somebody comes along and says, oh yeah, that's great Aunt Bessie. She really had a love for those peonies, or peonies, whatever they are, the flower, right? And there isn't anybody else alive who still knows her. I'd be the only person who'd know that detail. Yeah. yeah. Are the demons stupid? No. They're evil, but they're not stupid. They're angels, the highest order of being in the universe. You have to keep that in mind. All right. The dead in general were not the responders. The demons were perfectly capable with their giant intellects of knowing the intimate details of the dead loved one's life and therefore perfectly masquerading as the dead loved ones. Thus they brought the ancient world, even God's own alleged people, under their direct control. You see, it's sort of I lost Great Aunt Bessie, she raised me. I loved her. I have felt her loss every day. But now that you've reconnected me with her, what do I want? You want to talk to her. Well, okay, we had a nice conversation. You want to know the future. Yeah, well, she told me something about the future. But I want Aunt Bessie in my life. So what's going to happen? Oh, she will show up. We're going to keep doing this, right? And two things happen. One is you get dependent on the medium and the spiritualist. And then if you have a certain ability, you begin to be able to do it by yourself. You have now connected yourself to Satan Incorporated, right? Which is very dangerous. Yeah. We shouldn't go any further without reminding ourselves of what God had told his people in absolute terms regarding this. The important point is made right in the middle of counsel regarding the gift of prophecy and true prophets. You see there at the bottom? It's from Deuteronomy 18. Mm -hmm. When you come into the land that Yahweh your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. When I see the word abominable, what do I know it means? Occult practices. Occult practice that is hated. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or daughter as an offering. What was the purpose of burning your child? To effect the future. To make the future go better. That's about prophecy. That's about prediction. I'm going to lose this war with the Hebrews. Right? The Hebrew army went over there to Moab. They thought they were going to win. They had the, they had the Moabite king trapped in a city. You know what he did? He, he brought his son up his in son front of them. On and the on wall. the wall, he sacrificed his own son in front of the Hebrew army. And you know what that stupid Hebrew army did? Oh, they, uh, they said, oh, okay, this is... Uh God, his God is going to take and uh, affect our, prevent us from winning. Oh, yeah, they said, oh, well, you know, we can't win now. Right. Chemosh, the God of uh, Moab, is going is to slaughter us. Because right? they believe that. Yeah, so you're just as pagan as he is. Right. All right. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or daughter as an offering. That's about affecting the future. Anyone who practices divination, or tells fortunes, or interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or a hypnotist. See, a hypnotist can make things come true how? Now, when you wake up, you're not going to be able to say the word brother. Right? And guess what? You can give the person plenty of opportunity, but what? He, he won't say brother. And that principle extends farther. You can influence that person to do things, right? One of the whole points of the book, The Manchurian Candidate, is 
you have this person who has been hypnotized to become an assassin and change the course of American history. Or a sorcerer or a charmer that is hypnotist or a medium or a necromancer or one who inquires of the dead. Okay. The medium sees the spirits and tells you what they're saying. The necromancer deals directly with the dead. It's a little stronger than mediumship. And someone who inquires of the dead is someone who has learned to do it themselves. For whoever, why does God hate this so much? Whoever does these things is an abomination to Yahweh. And because of these abominations, Yahweh your God is driving them out before you. Well, for one, they are looking to these beings, these, uh, these dead, to come who are as being equal with God. They put them on the same footing with God. They're looking for answers. And, and God says, no, 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 no. I, I'm a jealous God. Yes, and I saw this too. The, the medium will say, maybe John Edward or someone you know of who's been on television for years, the medium will say, you shouldn't trust somebody just because they're dead. If Uncle Frank was a jerk when he was alive, he's dead now, but he's probably still a jerk. So you shouldn't trust someone just because they're dead. But when he gives a reading, he's going to say, you're talking to your grandma? Your grandma wants you to X, right? Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, what has happened about don't trust somebody because they're dead? Oh, that blew out the window. Because in every reading, I'm going to tell you what this dead person wants you to do. Okay. So we see here in Deuteronomy 18, these are all the ways to affect the future that you do not do. The gift of prophecy is the, the thing you can do. Deuteronomy 18. So we see that the verb sha'al, to ask, Durash to seek, as synonyms often used in parallel, shows so the place where the dead are, who are being sought in the pagan cult, to tell us what we need to know about the future. In the Law of the Prophet in Deuteronomy 18, it is the prophet who fills that responsibility. In other words, the cult of the dead is one of the effective ways of extending false prophecy over God's people. Got it? Now, as I said, the spiritualism today isn't much. Right? There's a certain number of people who are into it, but it's not the main thing. But uh, ahead we have mass death. Ahead, not far ahead, but ahead we have mass death. And what will that mean to the living? They're going to be seeking to get those people back, right? And when you're desperate, even if you don't think it's real, you're going to do what? You're going to do it anyway. Well, you go to see if, it, yeah. see if it's true. Yeah. Well, and, let's go check this out, see if this works. And then you're shocked that Great Aunt Bessie is telling you things that nobody but you and her know. Modern translations sometimes minimize the importance of Sheol by translating it the pit or the grave or some related term. In fact, it is much more than simply the grave of an individual dead person. And it is also true that pit is something very common in the limestone hills of Palestine. Pits were often used as pens and or ways to imprison wild and dangerous animals such as lions. In like manner, many pits and caves were exploited as tombs, thus linking the idea of pit or cave to death, even more strongly to imprisonment. Hence, imprisonment in death. Right? Oh, the people who suffer the second death will feel that they are imprisoned in death. Yeah. In Daniel 6, the lion's den is a pit, specifically dug to keep lions in. Doubtless the sons of Jacob or Israel, remember the story? Uh -huh. Told him that Joseph 
must have fallen into such a pit and was eaten by lions. They had this coat of many colors. And what? It was covered with his blood. No, it wasn't. It, it was covered with animal blood. And it was torn. And it was torn. They brought it back to show their father that Joseph certainly met an unfortunate end. Okay? And uh, Jacob bought their story. It made sense. As horrible as it was for him. And they had to tell the whole story. What did you do? We, we, we buried him. Why did you bury somebody right away? Bring his body back here. Let me weep and mourn over him. No, you don't do that. Why? It was torn up. Well, it's in the Middle East. Yeah. If it's 114 out, you don't want to bring the body back. Why? Stink. Yeah. Maggots running through it. And... Okay. In fact, the image of a pit is parallel to Shaol as the prison where death abode is used more than 80 times in Scripture, running all the way from Genesis to Revelation. This use of the pit instructs us on what the bottomless pit, the abyss, means in Revelation, right? If the pit is the realm of death, then a bottomless pit is a pit image for death that is eternal, right? That is what the Revelation calls the second death. Say, I, I have a question. Revelation mentions the second death, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know where it mentions that? Perhaps if anybody had a telephone, they could look up in the blue letter Bible the word second death. We're looking to see, you know, people in YouTube land, if you have one, if you have opened your logos or whatever you use to study the Bible, you look it up, the second death, find out where it is in Revelation. All right, well, we got it in Revelation 2. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What did you just say to me? It comes up in Revelation 2, 11, 26. Read it to me. I don't believe it. Re read it he who me. has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Now think about this for a minute. The second death isn't explained to the end of the book of Revelation. And yet here in the messages to the seven churches, which is the first act, Mm -hmm. This is where the book starts. It says, if you overcome, you won't be hurt by the second death. Do you think that was a pointless statement? Or do you think Jesus knew that they would understand what he was saying? Oh, he, he knew they would understand. Oh, so that means that they knew about the second death what? Before they ever heard about it in Revelation. Got it, Ray? What? It's in the, it's in chapter 2 in one of the messages to the seven churches? Yeah. In fact, Revelation was all of a sudden, but the book of the Gospel of John grew over time. It had been around for a while. And Jesus says some ridiculous things there. He says, he who lives and believes in me will never die. No. Christians die every day, right? Yeah, he wasn't talking about the first death. He wasn't talking about the first death. You only get any sense out of that is if you know, oh, these are the same people to whom Revelation was written, that John wrote this gospel to. They what? They knew. They knew that there's two faces to death. All right. All right, so now we're talking about the bottomless pit and the second death. The third paragraph. One of the basic images in, in the Sheol text is that God should not leave the righteous abandoned in Sheol, the pit, forever. While all knew that they would die, their prayer was that their stay in Sheol be temporary. And short, hopefully. 
we saw that very, well, it doesn't matter if it's short or long because remember, whether it's uh, Methuselah who died the year of the flood or my father who died a couple of decades ago, it will seem neither long nor short to either one. Why? No There's no perception of time. All right? We saw the very thing in some of the quoted passages. In fact, Strong's Concordance, which frequently screws up the meanings, including later misinterpretations, which with original scriptural meaning, gets right to the point. It gives these meanings for Shaol. Here we go. I like this. A place of no return for the wicked, that is. Without praise of God, that's because there's no bodies. The wicked is sent there for punishment. It does indeed say that the, the, in the passages we're going to look at today, that the people understand and are embarrassed by the fact that they deserve to be here because they were so vicious in life. Okay. That applies to both the first and second death. The righteous are not abandoned to it, the basic request and hope. It is a place of exile, figuratively, in death, and of extreme degradation and sin. That is the result of that lifestyle. The righteous man may say, therefore my heart is glad and my radiance rejoices. My flesh also dwells securely, safely, confidently, for you will not abandon my soul no, nephesh, my body, to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. Well, that's Psalm 16, 9 and 10, and that is widely recognized as a messianic prophecy. Right? It's talking about the, the body dwelling securely. You won't be abandoned by nephesh, right? If you're in Sheol, that nephesh is a dead person. The dead body. Your Holy One will not see corruption, which is to say, what? Christ came forth from the tomb, not corrupted. This passage is part of the whole complex of ideas that while the current body may see corruption, nevertheless, a better body will rise to be in the kingdom of God without facing death. But we seem to see that once the wicked enter Sheol, they are there for good. We're going to find out that that isn't true, mm. but we're going to, but we see several passages that seem to say that. Yet in Revelation, we see that the wicked enter into Sheol at death and remain there during the millennium, only to rise at the second resurrection at the end of the millennium. Then comes the great white throne judgment, and the wicked enter again into Sheol, there to remain in the second death for all eternity. But from what we have seen in the Old Testament material so far, they are utterly, completely inert, powerless to do more than realize their state, a state utterly opposed to their evil character, a state of complete powerlessness that causes them torment. Their longing to be God is forever and always impossible. The righteous, meanwhile, grow closer to God for eternity, ever more like him in character and power. They have been given power to live directly in the presence of God, openly interacting with him face to face. Ironic. Is there any indication of a temporary stay in Sheol before the wicked are judged found in the Old Testament? Something parallel to or pre-sage of the millennial teaching? Yes. In the prophets, as you know, the day of the Lord is the great day of judgment, equivalent to the final great white throne judgment in Revelation. The prophet writes, okay, this is a missed text. Okay. What I mean is, this is a text that one person in a thousand might even know that exists. Terror, pachad, and the pit, pachat, and the snare, pach, are upon you. See what he did there? Are upon you, O inhabitant of the earth. He who flees at the sound of the terror, Pachad, shall fall into the pit, Pachad, and he who climbs out of the pit shall be caught up in the snare, Pach. For the windows of heaven are opened, that's a reference to the flood, and the foundations of the earth tremble. The earth is utterly broken, the earth is split apart, 
The earth is violently shaken. The earth staggers like a drunken man. It sways like a hut. Its transgression lies heavy upon it, and it falls and will not rise again. On that day, this is the day of the Lord. Okay. On that day, the Lord, Yahweh, will punish the hosts of heaven in heaven and the kings of the earth on the earth. They will be gathered together as prisoners in a pit. They will be shut up in a prison. And after many days, they will be punished. There it is. There is the advance notice of the millennium. Right there. There is one more parallel to Sheol that we have encountered several times already. It is the Hebrew word Abaddon, which means destroyer and its Greek equivalent, Apollyon, destruction. This is funny here. You know how Revelation interprets itself? Okay. This is a, just a perfect example of that. Revelation tells its hearers and readers, whether they're Jewish or Greek in background, that they should know who this is. Now this is the fifth trumpet. This is not just, this is not just something in Revelation. It's the fifth trumpet. The first of the three woes that ends human history. Huh. Five, six, and seven. Those are the three woes. Right, Ray? Yeah. This is the end of human history. So, Revelation thinks that its readers should understand what's being said. In the fifth trumpet, the first of the three final woes on mankind, a star falls from heaven who has the key to the bottomless pit. Well, the star who fell, that's just not another image for Satan. We recognize this as the realm of death. And to no surprise, the angel, Satan, unlocks the pit. And the entire demonic army comes forth and tortures mankind. You see, having them in a, locked up in a pit implies that God is putting some brakes on them. Right? Right? They can only do so much. But now, Satan falls from heaven and what is he given? He's given the key. He's to given the, the pit. key. And what's he going to do if you give him the key? He's going to unlock that door. He's going to, yeah. And what are they going to do? They're going to come out. They're going to come out. Okay. So that's a horrible time. And you read the fifth trumpet and you see that men long to die, but they can't die. There is so much agony. Right? The demons hate. They hate God, they hate the human race because the human race has been the object of God's affection. All right, I got it. They love to torture people. Boy, does the, does the Inquisition not prove that, right? We have noted repeatedly that the unique thing about the final events is that God's judgments on the world and mankind is that he allows sin free reign with no restraint, the worst possible judgment. The worst thing God could do is say, oh, I'm just going to step aside. Whatever happens, happens. He knows what's going to happen. Right. The head guy of this army is identified thus. Look at this. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. Well, I know who this is. This is the star that fell from heaven. Uh -huh. He had the key. Who else would he be but the angel of the bottomless pit? His name in Hebrew is Abaddon. And in Greek, he's called Apollyon. Now look. Revelation was written not to me, you and me, but to people in the seven assemblies in Asia, some of whom were of Greek background and others of whom were Jews, who had become Christians, uh -huh. right? All right. If, it doesn't matter if your mother tongue is <coughs> Hebrew and you've been trained in the scriptures by reading the scriptures in Hebrew or Greek. These are the names of this person. Have you got it yet? Right? Doesn't matter your background. I'm going to tell you, no matter whether you're a Jew or a Greek, who this is. So you don't miss it. It's that important. Now, we said the first receivers of Revelation were the Jews or Greeks, and that they really knew the Bible well. Either that or God, was, God the Father was really stupid, which I hesitate to suggest is probably true, probably not true. Right? Absolutely not. If he true. made the universe, he probably isn't confused. All right, so now 
There must be a reason that Revelation gives a double identifier here in both Hebrew and Greek. This unusual citation leaves no doubt about what the fifth trumpet is about. It is important. This is one of the three final woes. So, okay, Abaddon is an Old Testament word. It's a Hebrew word. Here we go. Six mentions of Abaddon destruction in the Hebrew Bible. Three are explicit that Abaddon is another identifier of Sheol. Job 26, 6, Proverbs 15, 11, and 27, 20. One equates Abaddon with death and the inability of the wicked to perceive wisdom, Job 28, 22, and another with the grave or tomb, Psalm 80 and 11, the passage we just looked at. And the last one sees Abaddon as a fire that burns to the root of all life, Job 31, 12. All of these are behind the reference in Revelation 9, 11. Since Revelation 9 here is about the fifth trumpet, the first of the three great final woes on mankind, it is imperative that we understand what is being said. The final experience of the second death and the eternal torment begins in the fifth trumpet. Hell comes to earth even before the story of mankind is over. They're already in torment, but they can't die. Oh, okay. In each of these six mentions, it is interesting to look at the Septuagint. That's the Greek translation, right? Uh -huh. And see how does the Greek, the standard Greek, there's many Greek translations, there's old Greek and others, but this is the standard one. How did it translate Abaddon? Take a guess. It's going to translate Abaddon as some form of Apollyon, right? Uh -huh. Come as no surprise, whatever Abaddon is, it's always translated into Greek as a form of Apollyon. Revelation wants its readers to make sure they get the connection between the final state of the lost and what happens in the fifth trumpet. And now, I like this sentence, and now, knowing neither Hebrew nor Greek, you get the connection too. Right, Ray? Once the concept has taken root that while all die and therefore all go to Sheol, that is not the ultimate fate. Some faithful will be ransomed from Sheol and not abandoned there. In this sense, some texts speak of avoiding Sheol as the ultimate fate. Thus we have many texts that read like this from Proverbs. The wise man's path leads upward to life that he may avoid Sheol beneath. Well, he's going to die if he's wise or not. But what? This is saying you're going to avoid Sheol in the sense of what? Staying Of there. ending up there. Right. If you will beat him, the child with a rod, you will save him from Sheol. Since Proverbs is built on the contrast between Lady Wisdom and the harlot, we have a contrasting picture of those who visit the harlot. Her, the prostitute's feet, go down to death. Her steps follow the path to Sheol. Her, the prostitute's house, is the way to Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. All right. The next one is really creepy. But he, the prostitute's victim who's visiting her, does not know that the shades, the Raphaim, the collapsed ones, are there. Her guests are in the depths of Sheol. Right? He's like inches away from the dead that he's surrounded by, but he doesn't know it. Well, that's creepy. Like just like a regular horror movie. In a comment on leading a satisfied life, Proverbs makes the comment, Sheol and Abaddon are never satisfied, and never satisfied are the eyes of man. But there they are together. We already have seen some remarkable statements from the prophet Isaiah, including that a great multitude of the rulers of Jerusalem are going to go down together to Sheol. Now, this requires some historical background. Okay. Very often, you can't interpret what a prophet is saying unless you know something about the history, right? That's what exegesis is. The prophet lists his dramatic call in the temple as in the year good King Uzziah died. Now, I could try to work this out for myself. It's very complex and very confusing. But Edmund Tilly did that before I was born. 740 to 739. 
a few adjustments have been made in all the years since, but he was never off by more than two years. Right? Pretty good. Yeah. You see, the kings of Israel, their reigns were, were, you notified the beginning and end of the reign by the corresponding kings in Judah. He began in the eighth year of Asa and ended in the 19th year of Jotham. Okay. And vice versa. But the problem was they didn't add up. If you compared what it said, you never came out right. And yet it's all the way through the Deuteronomic history. Was he a nut? He keeps telling you he was consulting the chronicles of the kings of Judah or the kings of Israel. He tells you, I took these, I took these right out of the chronicles, the kings of Israel or the kings of Judah. If you want to read the rest of it, go, go there and read it. Well, we don't have them to go read. We have to take his word for it. He consulted the official chronicles of the two kingdoms. Well, when he was writing, Israel didn't exist anymore. How come he had the access to the chronicles of the kings of Israel? Well, because when it became clear that Israel was going to be destroyed by Assyria, that Assyria had had enough, lots of people weren't stupid. They said, you know what we should do? We need to store these away. We, should, we need to take our stuff and anything we consider important and go to Judah. Demographers tell us, uh, archaeologists tell us, that the size of Jerusalem grew fourfold in the reign of Hezekiah. Hmm. Well, yeah, I understand. I know where all those people came from. Right? That's, it wasn't until Hezekiah's grandson, Josiah, that anybody heard of the book of Deuteronomy. They were restoring and cleaning the temple. It lasted 400 years. It needed restoration on a regular basis. And the high priest came to Josiah and said, uh, we found a book in the temple. I read it. And we're in trouble. It's not good news. But I really think that you as the king need to read this immediately. Well, how come it wasn't there all along? Because it's a northern production. Somebody in Israel had the good sense to say, we've got to take this with us. And where shall we put it? We'll put it in Yahweh's temple. Okay. All right. So in 740 to 39, Isaiah died. Remember Isaiah? He made the mistake of wanting to be the high priest. And he became leprous. And so he wasn't, he wasn't buried with the kings of Judah. Because he died a leper. And he died a leper, it says, because he was, you know, he never should have been in the temple doing what he was doing. Okay. So, in fact, in the 19th century, somebody was plowing a field, I believe it was on the Mount of Olives. They clinked against something. And it was a bone box. And it said in Paleo, Paleo Hebrew, the old lettering, before the time of the exile, uh, hither, were bought, hither were brought the bones of Uzziah, king of Judah. Because he wasn't buried with the others in the royal tombs. Now, of course, when the Babylonians came, what did they do to the, to the royal tombs? Destroy them. Yeah, at what, the contents, what would they have done with the contents? They'd have burned them, probably. Yeah, take the bones out and burn them, right? But because Isaiah was a leper and was buried elsewhere, his are the only bones we have. Now, there's an irony, right? Okay. So, Isaiah died, made a mistake, but we have to say character is not a mistake. Character is what's characteristic of you. What do you usually do? General right? There's a general tendency, right? That's, that's 
It's not by the occasion, I'm quoting now, it's not by the occasional good deed or the occasional misdeed that character is judged. Actually, there's a whole chapter in Ezekiel that says that very thing. When Isaiah died, the kingdom was left in the hands of his son Jotham and his wicked son Ahaz. Now, you have to understand something about the culture. When I have a, ch a son, well, I'm going to raise that son up. When he has a son, he's still in my house. I'm going to be the father. It's a big that. house, too. But yeah, I'm going to be father of that. And when he has a son, most of these people were have. You're married off when you reach puberty, right? Mm -hmm. By the time you're 15, you have a child, right? Most of the kings of Judah had children by then. There wasn't any, oh, teenage sexual activity, right? No, there's, there's no such thing, right? If you're a teenager, you're married and raising your children. And you don't have any experience, but that's okay. Why? Because you're living with dad and mom. And grandma right. and grandpa, yeah. This is why it says that God will show mercy to thousands of generations. He'll visit the iniquity on the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Why? If you're an evil person, what? You're going to raise your children the to be evil. The third and fourth generations from you are going to be evil. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But shows, showing mercy on thousands of generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Okay? All right. So, this is, this is the call of Isaiah in Isaiah 6. In the temple, the year Isaiah died. How is, how is Isaiah feeling about Judah's prospects? He's not feeling good. That left the kingdom in the hands of Jotham and his wicked son Ahaz. Jotham lived only another four years. And that left Ahaz as the head king. Right? Now, a profligate pagan who worshipped idols and sacrificed his own son as an offering to them. You think he was a little bit pagan? Huh, no, he was fully indoctrinated and he absolutely embraced the uh, Canaanite religions. And he wanted things to go well. So, hey, that kid was the next king. I'm not interested in him. I'm interested in what happens to me. All right. So this is a bad guy. Right? This is a really bad guy. And this is what Hezekiah is left to uh, oh, Hezekiah, what Isaiah is left to work with. Right? In the very next chapter, the the king of Syria and the king of Israel are joined together, they're going to attack Judah and kill the Davidic monarchy and take control of Judah. And Ahaz is worried about it, as he well should have been. And uh, this is when he's told, don't, don't worry, God's going to protect you. But he didn't take that. Uh, Isaiah said to him, I'll tell you what, God will give you a sign. Ask for a sign, as high as heaven or low as hell. Ask for a sign. He'll give you a sign. You won't have to panic. And the king said, I, I'm not going to tempt God. I'm not going to do that. That made Isaiah angry. Well, you just don't believe. That's all that's going on here. Right? You don't want to publicly ask for a sign and then it doesn't happen. That's all that's going on here. All right. Israel was destroyed in 723 B.C. Now, that's during the time of these kings. All right? This is 17 years after his call. Isaiah is still alive. Only Judah was left. It was still under the control of pagan Assyria. Little wonder that the prophet saw Judah's situation as nearly hopeless. He also sees two outcomes for those in Judah. An ultimate death or an ultimate life. Both are possibilities that were clearly understood by the time of Isaiah. Many had adopted the idols and demon gods of Assyria, but the righteous took a different course. In the crisis that would or might destroy Judah, the prophets saw two different outcomes. 
resurrection for the martyred righteous, your dead bodies shall live. Their bodies or corpses shall rise. You who dwell in the fine dust, awake and sing for joy. For your dew is the dew of the dawn, and the earth will give birth to the Raphaim, the sinking ones, the powerless ones, or in the grave. So we have moved all the way from an uncertainty and hope for resurrection in Job to certainty centuries later in Isaiah. Truth is progressive in its revelation. Notice that it is the dead bodies or corpses that will rise. The righteous like the wicked here are Rephaim, sunken, powerless in death. Once again, the fine dust references the original creation of Adam. But the prophet does not see a successful future for the wicked nation as a whole in evading death when the impending invasion of Assyria arrives. We've already seen some remarkable statements from the prophet Isaiah, including that a great multitude of the rulers in Jerusalem are going to go down together to Sheol, 514. And this requires historical background. Okay? So, what we've seen now is that this has all come to pass. Now, what, what happened, ironically, is we have Jotham, we have Ahaz, right? we have someone else coming on. Right? Therefore, the word of the Lord to you scoffers, you scornful ones, who ruled this people in Jerusalem. The government was corrupt, right? Because you said we've made a covenant with death, and with Shaol we have an agreement, when the overwhelming whip or scourge passes through, it will not come to us, for we have made lies our refuge and falsehood, we have taken shelter. Yep, officially, what are they telling the Assyrian government? We are your faithful servants. What they were really doing was fomenting rebellion. Okay. In agreement with the statement that the whole host of rulers in Jerusalem will go down to Shaul together, he now addresses the rulers as the scornful, the scoffers, who do not take his prophetic warning seriously. They are aware that Assyria might be dissatisfied with Judah or may decide it needs to deal with a newly ascendant Egypt. Either way, Judah will suffer a serious blow. Therefore, the leadership has taken pains to make sure that they are not held responsible and will not be massacred. And the Assyrians did massacre whole cities. They did do that. If any of that happened. But the prophet says that the deal they made is dead. Ah, Ariel, which means lion, Ariel, the city where David and Cain. Add year to year, let the feasts run their round. Yet I will distress Ariel, and there shall be moaning and lamentation, and she shall be to me like an Ariel. Oh, wait a minute. There's another meaning. An altar hearth where things are burned up, where the hot coals are, that hot enough to burn the skin, right? Well, at first it was a lion. The lion city, because David was the lion of Judah, right? But then he has punned on that because it all could also be an altar heart, which has been burned, okay? The bemoaning and lamentation, she shall be to me like an aerial, an altar heart where things are burned up. So I will encamp against you all around and be, will besiege you with ballistic towers and I'll raise siege works against you. Then you will be brought low from the earth you shall speak. And from the dust your speech will be bowed down. Your voice shall come from the ground like a voice of a spirit or ove. And from the dust of your speech you shall whisper. Now, remember when it said the mediums would peep and mutter? Mm -hmm. The word is saf saf, T-S-A-F. Saf, saf. And so it would be. You hear it? Oh, yeah, I hear it. Today thing. they will record. You go to a 
a prison or a mental hospital or some place of former horror that is said to be haunted and probably is, but by demons, not dead folks. And you, you talk to the people there and you ask them to give you a sign, the lights of God or something, and they'll ask you to, you ask them to say something and they'll tell you, my name is Betty or something. Right. And it's really hard to understand, but when you play it back, it comes out quite distinctly. My name is Betty. Hmm. Okay. So we have that here. You think that you've got a deal where you won't be massacred, but you're, the, from the dust, your speech will be bow, bowed down. Your voice will come from the ground like the voice of a spirit. The voice of a spirit is not sustained. They don't talk like I sound now because they don't have what? They don't have bodies. And remember, these demons could speak very loudly if they want to. But they're, they're playing a role. Who are they? They're dead folks, right? And the word spirit or ov down there, that Hebrew word means exactly a spirit, a ghost. That's what it means, okay? The witch of Endor, we're gonna come there, who called up Samuel. Her title is, she was a mistress of Ov. Uh. She was a mistress to the spirits. Uh -huh. She was pretty powerful. You know how I know? She survived as long as she did. Saul put all the mediums to death, it says. But she had the connections and the power of what? Of the demons. She didn't get put to death. So when Saul says desperately, is there anyone I can talk to, somebody who can talk to a spirit? They said, oh yeah, yeah, we, we know somebody. Well, that's your own army. Huh? So what do I know you folks have been doing? Yeah, they've been uh, speaking with her, they've been consulting. Yeah. Did Samuel speak to Saul? Well, the scriptures say he did. No, they don't. Yeah, you're right. Uh, the witch of Endor spoke. She spoke. Yes. If Samuel started talking, I'd be saying, Get me Samuel. This is an evil spirit. Why? Because Samuel can't talk to you. He can communicate his thoughts to the... To the witch. To the witch. And she can... It's unfair to witches to call her a witch. She wasn't really a witch. She was a mistress of spirits. And she said... This, this is, is what he's saying. This is, this is, is how saying. he looks. Yeah. He's got a, 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 a long mantle on. He's, he's, he's not happy. He's not a friendly, happy person. And right now, he's mad. He's saying, why have you... Called me up? Right. Okay. If Samuel had talked... No, that's not how... It's, no. Uh, right. So this, your voice shall come to the ground like the voice of an oaf. From the dust your speech shall whisper. Though Jerusalem is the lion city where David the lion of Judah camped, it will not only be besieged, it will be destroyed, burned by fire like on an altar. God himself will be in this judgment. And they will be speaking from the dust, but not with a human voice. Devoid of physical reality. The great gulf between life and death in the Bible. That's what the difference between life and death is. They will shout in a whisper, so to speak. Hmm. Real speech, like everything else, is physical and now gone. The prophet emphatically pictures their state of death. They may be aware, they may want to speak, but unlike 
when they were powerful people, even ordinary speech is gone. In a parallel scene where Ove is used, the spirit, the spirit does not speak directly, but uses the medium as a genuine medium. What does that mean? The, the, it's a medium between the two kinds of things. Come to that shortly. Eventually, Isaiah was able to work closely with a good king, which was a rarity in Judah. King Hezekiah was stricken after a while. He's been working with him for a while. This is after the wicked kings. Along comes the good king. Well, he was a, he was a little boy when he became king. And that, now I got it. The regents were usually the priests. Right? That's why Josiah was a good king. It's no accident that the two kings that were raised up by Yahweh's priests were good kings. Right? So anyway, he, he is going to die. Hezekiah is sick, and Isaiah tells him, put your self in, house in order, you're not going to survive, you're going to die. Hezekiah bitterly asks God to spare his life. The request is granted. He praises God for deliverance and tells us some more important points about Shaul. Oh, restore me to health and make me live. Behold, it was for my welfare that I had great bitterness. But in love you have delivered my life, my nephesh, from the pit of destruction. For you have cast all my sins behind your back. Right? Hezekiah sees himself as dying because of something he's done wrong. Right? And that's what's implied by Isaiah saying, set your house in order. He says, for Sheol does not thank you. Death does not praise you. Those who go down to the pit do not wait in hope for your faithfulness. Emeth, truth, faithfulness. Specifically, what about that last part? Sheol doesn't thank God and death doesn't praise him? Does that not indicate the dead are unconscious? That's how it be interpreted. Nope. For Sheol does not thank you, death does not praise you. Those who go down to the pit do not wait in hope for your faithfulness. Isaiah 38, 16. This is the picture of... Uh, Hezekiah is dying. He asks for a sign. The sign is, he does ask for a sign, unlike his grandfather, he has. And the, the sundial goes back 15 degrees. Remember that? Uh -huh. It's important to note that giving thanks to Yahweh is something done aloud. Often choirs antiphonally sing thanks to God, as we see in the Psalms. Indeed, the parallel line is, death does not praise you. And here we have the verb, Hillel to sing, to shout praise, right? And we are familiar with this word in its imperative mood. This is a command. Praise Yah. And that is hallelujah. You can't sing the hallelujah. You don't have uh, teeth and lips and a tongue. Yeah. And by the way, it's hallelujah, not alleluia. Alleluia is Latin. Right. The word is a Hebrew word. It's hallelujah. Right? Well, hallelujah sounds high class, but it's not. And now, this famous song, right? The hallelujah, you mm -hmm. know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's Leonard Cohen. And the name should tell you something. Leonard Cohen would be a what? Jewish, because the word Cohen is what? That's the word priest. So anybody that you know that's named Cohen, their last name is saying they have a priest as an ancestor. Okay? So he would not have written the Alleluia, right? Hmm. He wrote the Hallelujah. Right? S someone edited it. Yeah, some not knowing what they were doing. But all the great singers know what, what they're to do. All right, it means to sing or shout praise to God. We're familiar with this in the imperative mood, praise Yah or hallelujah. In like manner, the dead are not waiting for God to act 
since there is in fact no sense of time passing in a state devoid of physical senses. The pit is the word for a trap for wild and dangerous animals. In effect, the dead person is imprisoned. By contrast, the inability to give thanks, which is dependent on a physical reality, since the term reflects something that is both done loudly and publicly, we see the faithful king contrasting what would have been his situation with what it is since he has had his life extended. The living, the living, he thanks you, as I do this day. He's drawing a contrast. I would not thank you if I'd gone to Sheol. Why? Nobody does. Why? Can't. They can't. Not possible. And that's the emphasis he's making right here. The living, the living, he thanks you. There's no doubt that what I'm saying is correct. The Father makes known to his children your faithfulness. Now that's a truly, truly ironic statement. This is the psalm that he sang the day he was delivered from death. He lived 15 more years. Uh -huh. In fact, he was told by Isaiah, you've got 15 years. And in those 15 years, he fathered children. There's something rather tragic in these words. Hezekiah was granted 15 more years of life, time enough for him to have a son and train him to some extent to be a king who served Yahweh. The father makes known to the children your faithfulness. But that isn't what happened. Okay. The son born, born during those 15 years was Manasseh, Hezekiah's oldest son. He became king and co-regent with his father when he was 12. Right? He reigned a total of 55 years. What have I told you about kings who reigned for a long time? Power. By the time you're done, this, most people of the world don't remember a time when you weren't the king, right? He re Despite his 12-year co-regency with his father, but he was just a kid, he was the most evil and openly pagan of Judah's kings, right? It says in the Deuteronomic history, he himself repented in his old age, but it was too late. The damage he had done, the things he had done, made Judah a thoroughly pagan nation. It was never, it wasn't fixable. As far as the Deuteronomist is concerned, from Manasseh forward, it's just a matter of how's the story going to end, because it is going to end, right? Yes. Under Manasseh, God pronounced a finality on Judah. It would cease to exist as surely as Israel had. Amazingly, when Assyria did invade Judah, the small kingdom survived, though barely. Surprisingly, when Manasseh personally repented after being taken captive to Assyria, he was allowed to return to Judah as a vassal of Assyria. But the biblical historian tells us that as a result of his pagan approving reign, it was too late to reform Judean society. Judah, as an independent entity, must end. Now we're talking about the Hebrews. 1450, right? By the time uh, you get down to the destruction of Judah in 586, 1450, 550, what's the difference? A thousand years. 900 years. This was a real sad thing to, to see. God had been working with them through the Hebrews for 900 years. And in the end, it failed. Manasseh's grandson, Josiah, did everything he could to stem the tide of paganism. He championed a reform suggested by Jeremiah on the basis of the book of Deuteronomy. But when Josiah died suddenly, paganism rebounded. Then, shockingly, Assyria itself collapsed at the hand of the Medes and the Babylonians. For a brief time, Judah was self-governing before the Babylonians 
took it over as a form of buffer from Egypt. The ruling party in Judah wanted to hear nothing about God's verdict delivered through Jeremiah, that Judah must be under the control of Babylon for 70 years. Repeatedly, Judah secretly rebelled against the Babylonians in hopes that Egypt would come to their aid. The rebounding influence of Egypt spread hope that Judah could survive against Babylon and against the prophecies of Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Both prophets wrote great detailed sections about these nations and God's plan for the huge changes that were happening at this period. Ezekiel had much to say about the mistake of relying on Egypt or its allies to save Judah from Babylon. What Ezekiel said about Egypt gives us more insight into the dead in Sheol. In the collection of woes on the nations. Now listen, Jeremiah, Ezekiel have these. It was a time of huge change. All the power structures were changing in the world. And so we have the sections, long sections in Ezekiel and Jeremiah of woes on the nations saying, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen to this nation. This is what's going to happen to that nation. So you, could, so you understand what's going on. Right. In the collection of woes on the nations in Ezekiel 31, we have commentary on the collapse of Assyria and its dependence. Dependencies. But that seems to suggest that Egypt is now the rising power in the world and can save Judah from Babylon. I will give it into the hand of a mighty one of the nations, Babylon. He shall surely deal with it as its wickedness deserves. I have cast it out. Hmm. I made the nations quake at the sound of its fall when I cast it down to Sheol, that's uh, Assyria, with those who go down to the pit. And all the trees of Eden, the choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water, were comforted in the world below. So, just as Assyria had been destroyed, so Egypt would be destroyed, and there's no hope there that Egypt is going to have the power to withstand Babylon. Notice that? The dependent nations who collapsed with Assyria are now under the thumb of Egypt, but will be comforted in the world below. That Egypt too has gone down to Sheol with them and is now as impotent as they are. The usual awareness of the dead is once again presupposed. Thus says the Lord God, on the day the cedar went down to Sheol, I caused mourning. I closed the deep over it and restrained its rivers and many waters were stopped. I clothed Lebanon in gloom for it, and all the trees of the field fainted because of it. I made the nations quake at the sound of its fall when I cast it down to Sheol with those who go down to the pit. And all the trees of Eden, the choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water, were comforted in the world below. Once again, let me say that if the Holy Spirit wanted us to know that the dead are unconscious rather than asleep, these prophets most certainly did not reflect that. In fact, in many different ways, with much more yet to come, we are learning that the dead are weak, usually asleep, never a source of guidance, but not unconscious. Right? Mm. One of those dependencies, however, sees an opportunity, and that is Egypt. And what makes that significant to the prophet is that Judah's leaders are depending on Egypt to save them from the rising power of Babylon. Though Jeremiah had already repeatedly warned against this course of action as against God's will and potentially disastrous, they are intent on following that policy. Thus, one word of warning here from Ezekiel. Whom are you thus like in glory and in greatness among the trees of Eden? You shall be brought down with the trees of Eden to the world below. You shall lie among the uncircumcised with those who are slain by the sword. This is Pharaoh and all his multitude, declares the Lord God. You may not know, but the Egyptians practiced circumcision. They considered the uncircumcised as unclean and beneath the level of Egyptian purity. Laying with the uncircumcised is a real threat to their dignity. Mm. Right? One of the great purposes of Ezekiel's prophetic work, like that of Jeremiah before him, was to somehow keep the leaders of Judah from making a fatal mistake 
by relying on Egypt to save them from Babylon. Is that clear? Daniel 11. The king of the north is fighting the king of the south. The king of the north is Babylon. The king of the south is Egypt. To get to Babylon, you have to travel north. To get to Egypt, you have to travel south. There's no doubt about who they are. That's why Egypt is one of the main subjects of the woes on the nations. Despite all the efforts of these two major prophets, Judah took the suicidal route. In fact, reading through the woes on the nations in Ezekiel, one is struck by the fact that so much of what was happening in this time of change depended on the ascendancy of Babylon and the decline of Egypt. What we can read easily from our vantage, the leaders of Judah, blinded by Satan, could not see. The 800 years of salvation history bound up in the Hebrews was coming to an end. Before it was over, a new religion, Judaism, and a new people, the Jews, would be the key to God's actions in history. Send a man, wail over the multitude of Egypt and send them down, her and the daughters of majestic nations, to the world below, to those who have gone down to the pit. They shall fall amid those who are slain by the sword. Egypt is delivered to the sword. Drag her away and her multitudes. The mighty chiefs shall speak of them with their helpers out of the midst of Sheol. They have come down. They lie still the uncircumcised, slain by the sword. Once again, in a passage that accords perfectly with the prior major prophet, we see the entrance of a significant power into Sheol. This time it is not a particular emperor, like Saga II, but Egypt itself, that has been slain en masse by Babylon and is entering Sheol. The ancient mighty chiefs comment. The prophet then begins an enumeration of the great powers that have preceded Egypt into Sheol. Remember the shock at the entrance of Sargon? But now we have a whole of that once great power in Sheol. Assyria is there and all her company. Its graves all around it, all of them slain, fallen by the sword, whose graves are set in the uttermost parts of the pit. There was no love for Assyria anywhere in the ancient world. It's down at the bottom. Her company is all around her grave, all of them slain, fallen by the sword, who has spread terror in the land of the living. Assyria as an empire has now ceased to exist. One of the most vicious of the ancient powers, it is at the bottom of the pit. But there are more, and we are in for a few surprises. Elam is there, and all her multitude around her grave, all of them slain, fallen by the sword. These are people who have lost the war, who went down uncircumcised into the world below, who spread their terror in the land of the living, and they bear their shame with those who go down to the pit. Know the experience of shame and Sheol. They can experience shame. So that it means that they are conscious, right? This is the surprise. Meshach Tubal is there. It doesn't say Meshach and Tubal. Meshach Tubal is there. These are the cities or the people who are confused by modern dispensationalists with Moscow and Tubal. Oh. They are also the powers that lead the invasion against restored Israel after the exile. But they're already dead. So what must have happened? When we go over to Ezekiel 38 and 39, the invasion of the pagan powers against the Messianic kingdom, these people are leading. And they're dead here. Oh, he's looking. Yeah. Meshach Tubal is there and all her multitude are graves all around it, all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword, for they spread terror in the land of the living. And they do not lie with the mighty fallen, the mighty the fallen from among the uncircumcised, who went down to Sheol with their weapons of war, whose swords were laid under their heads, and whose iniquities are upon their bones, for the terror of the mighty man was in the land of the living. The reason this is such a surprise is that uh, a few chapters further, Meshach and Tubal are leading the invading armies, attacking the Messianic kingdom from all sides. That's the Gog and Magog war of Ezekiel 38 and 39. They have these ancient evil powers. Must they have been 
uh, resurrected? Apparently. That is most certainly the case in Revelation. The, the Gog and Magog war is after the millennium in Revelation, right? Uh -huh. It's led by Gog and Magog, who are said to be dead. Well, the only reason that they could be leading the pack would be as if they were raised up alive. All right, remember that Isaiah says the wicked will be gathered in a pit after many days and face their judgment. The idea of gathering together into the pit, keeping them there for a long time, then releasing them so they can attack the Messianic kingdom. The major outlines are already here. Edom is there, her kings and all her princes, who for all their might are laid with those who are killed by the sword. They lie with the uncircumcised, with those who go down to the pit. Ezekiel 32, 39, 29. Edom was descended from Esau, the twin brother of Jacob, both sons of Isaac and Rebekah. But Edom sided with the Babylonians in the destruction of Judah, and that would keep it as an enemy forever. All right, so... Um, that's why Herod was, that's why Herod was hated. He was an Edomite, right? And the Jews hated the Edomites, right? The princes of the north are there, all of them, all the Sidonians who have gone down in shame with the slain for all the terror that they caused. By their might, they lie uncircumcised, so they're unclean. But those who are slain by the sword, and bear their shame with those who go down to the pit. Seems the wicked, now turned into nothing but a potential thought process, recognize that they are under judgment for what they had done in life. When Pharaoh sees them, he will be comforted for all his multitude, Pharaoh and all his army, slain by the sword, prophetic declaration of, Lord, of the Lord God. For I spread terror in the land of the living. This Naum Yahweh, Prophetic declaration of Yahweh appears fairly, fairly often. You'll see it uh, more times again. <laughs> and he shall be laid to rest among the uncircumcised, with those who were slain by the sword, Pharaoh and all his multitude. Again, prophetic declaration of the Lord God. All right, in summary, once again, we have two major prophets separated by a century facing similar problems with a rebellious Judah. In both cases, the role of Sheol and the nature of the state of, of the dead is discussed as part of the whole picture. And it isn't quite what we thought we were going to get. All right. That's a lot of information in a short time. Do you feel like it was basically clear? Okay, uh, the next section will take up some special events having to do with the dead and death. Uh, there's some specific passages we have to look at. And we just got a nice general basis by talking about Sheol and the dead in it. And next time we're going to be looking at specifics that have to do with um, what's coming, where the for the dead are concerned. All right, let's just say our prayer. It says to praise the name of the Lord and the people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you and give you peace. <laughs>